Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, from time to time we talk about on this channel how we can look through different lenses at history to get different perspectives, to get a new view of why things happen. We talk about looking through the economic lens and understanding how uh, economic policy and economic conditions affect the things that happen. We can look through the military lens. We can look through the religion lens. And sometimes we can look through the food lens. Food drives history. We did a video a few weeks ago looking at the history of the world through the eyes of bread and grain, things like that. Uh, so today we're going to take a look at a channel that we haven't uh, looked at before on, the, uh, on this channel called Tasting History with Max Miller. A number of you have been recommending him to me. This is what pioneers ate on the Oregon Trail. Of course, Oregon Trail has kind of become this big meme. And for many of you who make these jokes and post these things, you weren't even around when we first played Oregon Trail, an iconic game from my childhood that I remember fondly. And, of course, everybody talks about that one line, you have died of dysentery. But it was a great game. It was really a lot of fun. So, uh, But the Oregon Trail is an important part of understanding American history, especially when we talk about the, the westward movement and manifest destiny and the Indian Wars and all of those things. So it'll be interesting to look at this through the lens of food. I don't know what I'm getting into, but the link will be down in the description to the original content so you can check out this channel without my commentary. Here we go. Most people around my age know one thing about the Oregon Trail, and that's that you're likely to die of dysentery. Ah, <laughs> yes. But it turns out there was so much more to this 2,000 plus mile trek west, including the fact that it took four to six months, and that you'd be having about 500 campfire meals, many of which would have been Johnny Cakes and bacon. So, so just for a second, just sit and think about that. Think about the courage that it took in a time and place in history when moving didn't mean hiring some movers, jumping in your car or in an airplane, and meeting them at the new place with your stuff the next day. It meant four to six months, a good chance some of you would die, relying on living off the land because there's no way you could take 500 days worth of food with you, or 500 meals worth of food with you, um, hoping to get to different forts along the way, traveling with other people that you don't know, dealing with the elements, dealing with uh, people who were hostile to you moving through their land. It's, it took a lot of guts to do this kind of stuff. So thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video as we try not to die of dysentery. This time on Tasting History. Love it. Love it. So for those who don't know, the Oregon Trail was actually a collection of wagon trails that went from Independence, Missouri to Oregon City, Oregon. And from 1846 to 1869, about 400,000 settlers, farmers, miners, ranchers, and their families used it to it's cross 2,200 miles of prairie, desert, and mountain terrain. Now, it wasn't exactly a single trail, and there were people who would split off to go settle in California or Utah, but in general, for about half of the year, there were wagon trains heading west along a general trail. And, of course, this leads to the creation of towns and forts along the way, because people are going to need supplies, they're going to need food, they're going to need a place to rest and recoup uh, before they move on to the next part of their journey. And so this creates a whole industry of people along these roads. And yeah, the, the varying trails, of course, then that leads to people saying, hey, I've got a better trail, I've got a better way to go. And sometimes people would take that like the Donner Party, who believed in uh, some people who told them that there was a shortcut to get where they wanted to go and it ended up taking longer and, of course, we know that whole story. And the people in those wagons were known as emigrants. And every morning, around 4 a.m., they would wake up, start making fires, so they could prepare their breakfast. And one of the most common breakfasts was bacon, hoe cakes, nice. or johnny cakes, which are a corn cake, and coffee. Now, these johnny cakes were very popular at the time. They had been popular since the 18th century. And they went under a host of names, including hoe cakes, but also Indian meal cakes or Indian corn cakes, which is what the Farmers and Emigrants Complete Guide from 1856 calls it. Written by Josiah T. Marshall, it says, take one quart of sifted Indian meal, two tablespoonfuls of molasses, two teaspoonfuls of salt, a bit of shortening, lard or butter, half as big as a hen's egg, stir these together, make it pretty moist with scalding water, 
put it into a well-greased pan, smooth the surface, and bake it brown on both sides before a quick fire. So I'll be honest, just right off the bat, I I'm thinking about this, and I'm, I'm thinking, man, they, they actually seem to have eaten better than I expected they would on a journey like this. Uh, because Just think about, I mean, each family would have had to take a lot of this stuff with them to be able to eat like this every single day. Now he does have instructions to make a fancier version that has milk and cinnamon and ginger, but I'm going to make this basic version because I feel like this is what most people would have been eating on most mornings on the Oregon Trail. And frankly, if you need the fancy version, then the Oregon Trail is probably not for you. I'm sure those people on the Oregon Trail would have really appreciated some, some free dessert. Alas, at least in the mornings, all they had was, was Johnny Cakes and bacon. They had other things, but to make Johnny Cakes... To be honest though, doesn't sound bad. I could, I could probably eat that for breakfast most days. Cakes and bacon, what you'll need is two cups or 300 grams of fine cornmeal, one tablespoon of molasses, one teaspoon of salt, two tablespoons or 30 grams of unsalted butter, and some boiling water. And this is actually kind of awesome that he's describing how you can make this today to experience what they would have eaten back then. That's I like the concept, this is pretty cool. And then you'll also need some grease to grease the pan. And the best way to get grease, and probably how they would have done it, is to fry the bacon in that pan. Ah. It also should give the Johnny Cakes some nice bacony flavor. So first fry up your bacon however you like it, then set it aside, but keep the grease in the pan. Then add the molasses, salt, and the butter into the cornmeal, and then work it all in by hand, then pour some boiling water in, and using a spoon, start mixing it together. Huh. Now the amount of water that you add is really up to you. For a firmer cake, you're gonna add about three quarters of a cup of water, but Doesn't you can add bad. a little bit more for, for a, a looser cake. He's not super specific in, in how wet this mixture should be, but he does say that it should be smoothed on the top. So if it's too loose, you won't be able to smooth it. It'll just automatically do it. So I'm guessing it's a little firmer. So what's cool about this is this just goes to show us how much information we really have about this stuff. The, the fact that we can go and we can go to these primary sources that, that tell us exactly what they would have been eating and how to make it even a couple of hundred years later is actually pretty neat stuff. So form up some round cakes by hand and then heat the grease up and carefully set the cake in. Now unlike like pancakes, a cookie. which will have little bubbles form on the top that let you know when it's time to flip it, these don't have that, so you kind of just got to eyeball it. For me, it took about three minutes on one side and then two minutes on the other side. So obviously, if we're able to make these, we know that the emigrants would have been bringing cornmeal, molasses, bacon, and salt. When it comes to the butter, they would have often brought a milk cow with them, and in the morning, they would milk it, put it into a pail, and attach it to the bottom of the wagon. And throughout the day, the jostling of the wagon would actually churn it into butter. Wow. That they would and here's the thing, that not only do they get to bring all their supplies for starting a new life wherever they're going, They've got to bring all their food for themselves, and they've got to bring food for the animals, the animals that are pulling their supplies and any cows they would have. Have that night, some nice fresh butter. But it wasn't all Johnny Cakes and Bacon for every meal every day. So what else did those pioneers pack up to take with them before shouting, So it's the 1850s, and you have just had it with the East Coast. So you're moving west using that newfangled Oregon Trail. So you make your way to Independence, Missouri, where you pack up your covered wagon. Now, these were not the really big covered wagons that were rambling down the streets of yeah. America at the time. No, these were smaller covered wagons known as prairie schooners. And you need to gather up four to six months worth of provisions and pack it all into this rather small wagon. Think if you had to do that today, if you had to put four to six months worth of stuff into the back of a minivan and carry it with you intense. Luckily, people who have gone before you have written down general guidelines of what you might need. And when it comes to food, which is what I'm concerned with, for three people, they say you should bring about five barrels or 1,080 pounds of flour, 600 pounds of bacon, 100 pounds of coffee, five pounds of tea, 150 pounds sugar, 75 of rice, 50 of dried fruit, 50 of salt, pepper, and other seasonings, and 10 pounds of saleratus, or baking soda. Other guides from the period say to bring about 200 pounds of lard, plenty of dried beans, dried fruit, and cornmeal, and of course, about 120 pounds of hardtack. Many I love that these people had this information available to them, so they kind of knew how to plan. But 
that's a lot of stuff, man. I, I keep finding myself kind of in awe of the fact that they did this. People also brought that milk cow as well as chickens for eggs. Now all this food was either packed in barrels or more often in provision boxes, which could be stacked and so they wouldn't jostle around too much. Yeah. And they could be used for chairs and tables, which was really convenient when you had no chairs and tables. Now since there was no refrigeration, you might think that things like bacon and lard would, would go bad really quickly but people would take that and pack it inside of the barrel that had the flour or the cornmeal to keep it away from any sun, and so it would stay for pretty much the entire journey. Now, in addition to food, you needed to bring some cooking utensils. This typically meant a frying pan, a Dutch oven, a kettle or coffee pot, tin plates and cups, and maybe a reflector oven, which would huh. bounce the heat off of an open fire to bake cakes and pies. Wow. But in general, when it comes to packing, less is more. There was actually one pioneer from the time who had made the trek before, and he is scoffing at those he sees overpacking. They laid in an oversupply of bacon, flour, and beans, and in addition thereto, every conceivable gym crack and useless article that the wildest fancy could devise or human ingenuity could invent. And we all know how this is, right? We all have people in our lives who are overpackers. And you're like, why do you need this much stuff? And so it makes total sense that uh, when you have the the tens and hundreds of thousands of people who are traveling the Oregon Trail, that some of them are going to overpack, some are going to underestimate what they need. Uh, and you're going to find yourselves in situations where you uh, just have too much stuff and you can't get it moved, or you end up breaking down and you can't transfer it to another uh, wagon, or you underpack and you find yourself trying to live off the land, which I'm sure they had to do that to a degree anyway. Pins and needles, brooms and brushes, ox shoes and horseshoes, lasts and leather, glass beads and hawks bells, jumping jacks and jew harps, rings and bracelets, pocket mirrors and pocket books, calico vests and boiled shirts. <laughs> and much of this stuff would end up abandoned on the side of the trail within uh, the first few weeks of travel. Yep. Now the food that you're packing is not a when When you are in survival mode, when you are in the mode of just trying to make sure you can get through alive and get your family alive, Suddenly, things that you thought were really important lose their value really quickly. It's the only food that you're going to have on the journey. People were walking most of the 15 to 20 miles uh, that they traveled each day because being in the wagon was really uncomfortable. It was really bumpy. Yeah. They didn't have any shocks or anything. So most people were walking. So they were using up a lot of calories. So it was necessary to find extra vittles along the way. And in the early years, there were, no, there were no shops or trading posts along the trail. But by the 1850s, forts like Fort Kearney and Fort Laramie would have stores where you could top off your provisions or replace anything that might have broken, provided that they had it, and they, they very often didn't. They were usually just as just as out of things as, as you were. But yeah, remember, these are the days before you have a transcontinental railroad, which doesn't come until the 1870s. Uh, so it's not like you have an easy way to transport large amounts of supplies to these forts and these trading posts along the way. That stuff had to be imported the same way that you were carrying stuff. But if they did have it, you were probably going to be paying like five times yep. as much as you would back back in Missouri. Because when I uh, several years ago, I spoke at a high school in Bethel, Alaska, which is all the way over on, it's like in Southwest Alaska. So like I flew to Anchorage and then it was like another two and a half hour flight on a propeller plane to Bethel. Uh, and because they're so remote and so far removed and they don't have road connections to places like Anchorage, which is so far away anyway, a lot of this stuff is coming in by plane. And so the, the prices are just crazy. And this was this is before the modern prices. This is five, six, seven years ago. Uh, you know, I was getting a six inch sub. They had a subway uh, sandwich shop there. Six inch sub, some chips, and a medium coke. It was like twenty eight dollars. Um, you know, a bag of Doritos that here would have gone for three something at the time it was like nine or ten dollars there. The stuff's at a premium. Because what else are you going to do? A much less expensive way to get food, if a little more difficult, was to go back to your roots and hunting and gathering. Mm -hmm. 
and sometimes that would mean actual roots, things like wild onions and garlic, and something called camas root. The pioneer Phoebe Judson, writing about the American Indians she met, said, The camas root, a very nutritious pear-shaped bulb about half the size of an onion, was their chief dependence. It was to them what bread is to wow. us. The staff of life. So, and you have to remember that everybody's traveling these same trails. So it's not like you're just going to find berries on the side of the road. Uh, you know, that stuff would have been picked clean. It's not going to just be available everywhere. After steaming the bulbs in a hole in the ground with hot rocks covered with ferns, they were dried. This, with game, was their usual diet. You could also go fishing, provided you knew how and were near a river. And if you didn't know how, you could also do like Phoebe Judson and just trade for some fish. When we reached Salmon Falls on Snake River, the mm. Indians brought some red-meated salmon to the camp. Mr. Judson traded some sugar for a fine, large one. And as it was too late to cook it that night, he dressed it and put it into the water keg under our wagon. We were really so delighted with the prospect of salmon for breakfast wow. that we could not sleep. Think about the things that we take for granted being able to eat a good meal for breakfast in the morning and and these people were so excited over this that they couldn't even sleep uh it's easy to laugh at that now but that's how precious this stuff becomes and it's a lesson in life that we all have to learn to not take for granted these things that we just have available to us every day but the next morning when they woke up our beautiful fish was missing, what? and so was Mr. Bryant's dog. As we never saw him again, he evidently indulged in too much salmon for breakfast and paid the penalty with his life. As for game meat, on the prairie at least, you had prairie dogs, which were supposedly very, very fatty, but also ducks and rabbits and geese and sage hens. They'd use these hens to make a soup with dumpling that most people seem to really enjoy, but one woman did not. I think a skunk preferable. Their meat tastes of this abominable wow. mountain sage. Now these were of course small little critters, good for maybe one meal. But if you wanted to save up some meat, they had big game like antelope and of course buffalo. But the thing is, even just a couple buffalo or bison is going to be so much meat that you're not going to be able to eat that all in one sitting, even if you've got several hundred people in the wagon train. So they would have to, to store it. And usually that meant making it into jerky. They would cut it into strips and then hang it on a rope around the edge of the wagon. And so as they went down uh, the, the prairie, it would dry in the wind. And one person said it made all of the, the wagons look like they were decorated with a coarse red fringe. <laughs> now, most people really enjoyed the meat of the buffalo, but there is one story about a man who got an old bull and I guess the meat was not very good. It tasted like the chef d'oeuvre of the devil's kitchen. Wow. The most offensive meat I ever tasted, and so that I found it impossible to eat it. But typically, the meat was very much loved. Now, the emigrants on the Oregon Trail rarely had time to stop to get any more buffalo than they could eat or carry. But it was around this time that other people with more sinister intentions were decimating the yeah. buffalo population in an effort to destroy the food source of the Plains Indians. There's a very famous photograph, and I don't know if you'll show it, but that is often shown of this massive stack of buffalo skulls, just to show you how uh, large scale the operation was to eliminate these. In 1864, near the end of the Oregon Trail era, one emigrant wrote that some of our there men went today hunting for buffalo and antelope, but saw none. While the bleached bones of the buffalo are strewn all along the road, not an animal was seen. The needless and wanton slaughter of these once numerous animals has almost caused mm. them to be extinct. The thing is, it wasn't just the meat of the buffalo that both the Plains Indians and the pioneers relied on. It was their poop. See, if you've ever seen the Great Plains, you'll notice there aren't a lot of trees, not a lot of firewood going on. And so they would gather the chips or the, the poop of the buffalo to start fires. And I guess as long as it's dry, it burns really well and doesn't smell that much. And the hide is obviously a great source of warmth. Uh, pretty thick, a lot of fur. 
Uh, so there's lots of uses there besides just food. Many of the ladies can be seen roaming over the prairie with sacks in hand, searching for a few buffalo chips to cook their evening meal. Some of the ladies... Imagine are, cooking your food on poop. ...are seen wearing gloves, but most of them have discarded their gloves and are gathering the buffalo chips with their bare hand. And you know, the, you ever notice that when you start out doing something, you take all the precautions and you wear the gloves and you do the things, but as you get used to it and as it becomes something you do often, a lot of those things start to get discarded. We would think to ourselves, yeah, if I'm handling poop, I'm wearing gloves. But if you're doing it every day and if you're dirty and out on the planes anyway, suddenly you're like, I'm not bothering with all this extra steps. Your dried buffalo poop in hand, it was time to actually get to cooking. And this is where the pioneers just, they really, really impressed me. Because especially in the first part of their journey, where they still had a lot of the ingredients that they were bringing, they were making up some really fancy, complicated, complicated foods. If not, maybe not fancy, but complicated foods. They would always have fresh bread that could be risen with either uh, Salertus, which is baking soda, or the newfangled Preston's yeast powder. No excuse for bad bread. And should they run out of these, they would make salt rising bread, which mm. is just ingenious. So you know how like a sourdough starter relies on yeast to, to build up uh, to rise the bread? Well, salt rising bread relies on bacteria. Usually the ingredients were just water, salt, flour, and then some cornmeal or, or dried potato and it needed to be kept warm all day. So they would make it up and then put that ferment or that starter in the front of the wagon where it was warm and the sun was hitting it and it would start to rise. And then that night they could wow. use it to make fresh bread. Yeah, necessity, we say it all the time, necessity is the mother of invention. And when you have to come up with new ways to do things, you discover new ways to do things. Uh, stuff that you know we do today had to have been figured out at some point. Absolutely brilliant. But even more impressive than the bread was the fact that they were making pies and cakes out there. There are yeah. letters that talk about fresh made antelope pot pie and pound cake and peach pie and apple pie. Huh. Though often the apple pie was made with dried apples, which I guess was not always the best thing as there was a, a slogan during the time that said, spit in my ears and tell me lies, but give me no dried apple pies. Now the the meal that they seemed to go hog wild for was the 4th of July dinner. Mm. Part of it was that it was a big celebration because it's 4th of July, but also it was around the halfway point for many of, of the emigrants. And so they would kind of splurge and use up a lot of the good things that they still had left. And one of the things, too, with the Oregon Trail is just like with everything else, you know, they've, they've got these people publishing. Here's the list of about how many supplies you need. There were also milestones along the way where people knew they had to be at this particular point by this time. Uh, and so on and so forth. And so um, there's this place I actually got to visit a few years ago called Independence Rock uh, that's in uh, southern Wyoming. And it was, it's got carvings all over the place. Like people carved their names into it and the dates, like 1850s and things like that. It's really cool. It's super windy to go up there. I tried to make a video when I was there. This is before I even had this channel. Uh, but it was just so windy and I didn't have the right equipment to be able to deal with that kind of wind uh, and narrate a video. But um, it was called Independence Rock in part because people understood that they needed to be at about that spot by the 4th of July if they wanted to make it up and over the mountains before winter or before the fall weather hit, which would have basically been winter in the mountains. In 1849, William Swain wrote about the midday meal on the 4th of July. Dinner consisted of ham, beans, boiled and baked, biscuits, john cake, apple pie, sweet cake, mm. rice pudding, pickles, vinegar, pepper sauce and mustard, coffee, sugar and milk. All enjoyed it well. The boys had raked and scraped together all the brandy they could, and they toasted, hurrayed, and drank till reason was out and brandy was in. I love that. They drank till reason was out and brandy was in. I stayed till the five regular toasts were drunk, and then being disgusted with their conduct, I went to our tent, took my pen, and occupied the remainder of the day in writing to my wife. <laughs> or at least that's what he told her he did, I'm sure. Now, since this was a time when provisions started to run low, at least the more luxurious provisions, 
there were, of course, people who had already gone through them. Yep. George Keller had a 4th of July dinner on musty hard bread and beef bones in a state of incipient putrefaction. <sighs> and Amos Steck said that Ugh. it was just like any other day for him, and he had spent it driving a slow ox team in a sandy road. His eyes filled and his throat choked with it, with no other refreshment than hard bread for dinner and poor bread at that. He will feel little patriotic ardor stimulating him even on this great wow. day. Granted, these were the wagon trains that were made up of pretty much just men, because it was the women who did most of the real cooking. As James Hutchings lamented, I wish I had taken lessons in the art of every man, his own washerwoman, cook, and general housewife. But whether or not you could cook didn't really matter when you started to run out of ingredients. Yep which would happen the further down the road you got. And listen, I mean, granted, people back then, many of them had been raised to be much more self-reliant, to be able to provide for themselves, but not everybody could. Uh, and I know for me personally, if I had to go out and live off the land, I'd be in trouble. I've never hunted in my life. I wouldn't know the first thing about what kind of foods you can eat and what kinds you can't. Uh, I'd definitely be relying very heavily on other people with that kind of knowledge. All of the little delicacies we brought with us from home were gone, and we had nothing left but flour, bacon, beans, sugar, and tea. Not terrible, and like though. the children of Israel, my soul loathed this food, and I longed for something fresh. So the reference there is to when the uh, in the Bible when the people of Israel are wandering in the desert and they had manna and quail and manna and quail and manna and quail and manna basically just means what is this? It was like the I don't know food. Um, Eating the same thing over and over again every single day would get a little old after a while, but you do what you do to survive. The farther we traveled, the more meager became our fare. Mm. This was the time when the pioneers came to rely on things like buffalo jerky, hardtack, and portable soup. This was something where you would boil down the meat and bones of an animal so much that it became just this gelatinous kind of layer on the bottom of a pot. And then you would cut that up and let it dry, and you could take that then and later put it into some water and make a soup. It was like a bouillon cube. Yeah. Then there was something called meat biscuit. One pound of it contained the nutriment of five pounds of the best fresh beef. It will keep in perfect preservation for any length of time. In tight tin canister or casks, the traveler across the plain can always have a fresh supply of food easily and quickly prepared. Hmm. Now, the problem with the dwindling food supply was not just that it left everyone rather hangry, but also depressed. Because yeah. when you're traveling every single day, all day, it's kind of boring and monotonous. And the only thing people were looking forward to was their next meal. Yeah, that was when you stopped. That was when you socialized. That was when you broke up the monotony of the day. I Think, think about how quickly I, I work from home, right? And, you know... Day after day, just being home, not going out and doing things. If I if I don't have a lot of other things going on, where I'm really just kind of working from home and doing what I'm doing, it, it can you can get depressed really quick that way. Even if you're staying busy, even if you have TV and and fresh food that you can easily make, I can only imagine what this must have been like for them. And you're dealing with the weather, and you're dealing with the conditions, and dealing with threats from outside and disease from within. It's a lot to handle for anybody. Eating was the best part of the day, yeah. even in the harshest conditions. Ate breakfast this morning in a snowstorm, Ooh. and although the prospect did look rather gloomy, still we kept in good cheer. And our vittles, crusted not with sugar but snow, certainly disappeared in a manner that plain showed that we had not lost our appetites, even if we were experiencing all the delights of a snowstorm in the open prairie. It was also around this time that they started to run out of lemon extract. Mm. See, they would often add lemon extract and maybe a little sugar to their water to make a sort of, of lemonade because the water did not taste good. No. It was hard to find any kind of thing resembling clean water at all, but especially out in the prairie, everything was covered in dust. All of their stuff, themselves, their food, and their water just caked in dust. And so they would often add aluminum ammonia sulfate to the water, which would kind of help purify it, but it made it taste absolutely awful. When they didn't have that, they would just put cornmeal into the water and wait like 20 or 30 minutes. 
and as the cornmeal dropped to the bottom, it would take some of the dirt with them, leaving a little clean-ish water on the top, but still didn't taste great. Wow. And with people running out of their luxury items, their food, and sometimes clean water, the Oregon Trail was about to do them real dirty when they came upon Fort Laramie, also dubbed Camp Sacrifice. This was the last major stop before you headed over the Rocky Mountains. Yep. And as difficult on the oxen as it's been to drag your butt across the Great Plains, it's gonna be even harder for them to drag it up the Rocky Mountains. And if you're running late, I mean, there are times, and just speaking of like the Donner Party, who were going into California up into the Sierra Nevada Mountains, uh, once you get into like late September, early October, you're already dealing with snow. And they didn't just get a few inches of snow. You go there to the Donner Party site, which is right off of Interstate 80. It's not real far from Lake Tahoe. Uh, and, and you're seeing these measurements where they show that it was like 20 feet of snow. And there are checkpoints along Interstate 80 there where they won't even let you drive up into those areas if you don't have like chains on your tires. That's how brutal it gets, even in the modern times. So you had to get rid of everything that was extra. And I don't mean just like things like books and fine china and, and things that are kind of not necessary, though they did get rid of those. But in some cases, even things that were necessary if it was deemed too heavy. There was one wagon train who just needed to lighten the load, and so they discarded a ton of bacon, several barrels of bread, six dozen steel shovels, axes, hoes, etc., etc., amounting in value to nearly $1,500. That's a lot of money. Also, I love how they used to write etc., which was the ampersand C, because the et in etc. literally means and. I just think that's cool. I don't think anybody ever writes that anymore. Now it's just etc. Anyway, one thing that someone had to discard uh, kind of brings a tear to the eye. A man named Smith had a wooden rolling pin that it was decided was useless and must be abandoned. I shall never forget how that big man stood there with tears streaming down his face as he said, do I have to throw it away? It was my mother's. Uh. I remember she always used it to roll out her biscuits and they were awful good biscuits. I was gonna say there must be some sentimental value to this and we do that right we have things that would be absolutely worthless to anybody else or certainly not of any great value but to us they mean the world because of some reason some connection to a memory or to a person who's no longer here it's really amazing what these people went through yeah and gave up to start this new life and i don't just mean giving up their their mother's rolling pin but giving up everything that they had left behind. Many of these people would never again see the family and friends that they had known hmm. back, back east. And I don't think I could have done it. I really no, don't think I, I could have, have lasted very long doing six months of hard living, hard traveling, and hard eating. So, you know, just you, you know how much I, I love talking about my own family history and finding my family connections to historic events, but... I'm born and raised in Northeast Ohio. Most of my family history runs through Kentucky and Southwest Virginia and uh, Tennessee and North Carolina and, and Pennsylvania. Uh, so I don't really have any connections to the Oregon Trail. But if you live in California, Oregon, Washington, and, and your family's been there for generations, good chance you might have those family connections. And I think it's probably worth looking into and finding your own family's story of how they came across that trail. Uh, special people, man. It took a lot of guts and a lot of uh, just intestinal fortitude to be able to make a crossing like that. Maybe a week. I, I think I could have lasted a week. Maybe two if these Johnny Cakes taste as good, as good as they smell. And here we are. Hmm. A pioneer breakfast of Johnny Cakes and bacon from the Oregon Trail. So sometimes people would have put like honey or, or syrup or more molasses on these, but I'm going to just try them still hot. They look like cookies. Uh, as is. Here we go. It's good. I bet it's good. So the texture is a little, it's not dry. It's almost like gritty, but not unpleasantly so, but it's kind of, it's a little grittier than, than I might like. 
but the flavor is really, really good. I figured it probably I was. I kind of expected them to be bland, but... Well, no, because you put the molasses in there. I, I figure it's, like I said, I've said it a couple times now, it's got to be like a cookie. It's not. It's, you know, it's kind of like cornbread, mm. which, cornmeal. It's like cornbread and molasses mixed together, so you kind of get that sweetness. Yeah. But then the fact that it's, like, fried, basically, in baking grease... That, that's really nice. Mm. Uh, and you get a really, really nice bacony flavor to it. It kind of reminds me of like a 19th century version of a McDonald's McGriddle. I actually mm. think that uh, that these are gonna grow on me. This is something I could I could eat one or two of them. They're a little, I think it's just that they're a little more dense than like a fluffy pancake because there is nothing in there to, to raise it. Um, no raising agent, so it's just, it's just kind of heavy. But it comes with bacon. The bacon, of course, is uh, it's just bacon, but it's really fatty bacon because that's what they would have had. So I got the fattiest that they could, that I could find. So, so my kids, uh, that's really unflattering of me to pause him like that. So is that, but we'll go with it. Um, I, I love like good like bacon you know, like we have in the states, but um, that's a little more closer to like Canadian bacon or like British bacon, which is more like ham. Um, I think in the UK they call what we eat in the States streaky bacon. I had a friend who told me uh, what you call bacon is what we cut off of our bacon. But I don't know. And it's really, really good. Also, how cool is this fork? I got it from Townsend's. They have a bunch of really just cool stuff from this period, mostly earlier, 18th century, but um, I thought it fit. Plus, it's just, it's just cool looking. So I think these are something that you should you should try. They're, they're, it's totally worth it. Maybe swap out some of the you know water for milk or just kind of play with it. You can add some spice, make the fancier version. Hmm. But even as is, especially you know if you're going across the prairie and you're really hungry, that's a great meal. So get so that was really cool. Uh, like I said, it's a different lens through which to look at history. So with that in mind, if you have a particular one of his videos or another channel, like I think you mentioned Townsend's, and I don't know if that's connected to the channel, the Townsend's, which I knew I know do a lot of similar stuff, um, let me know in the comment section a particular recommendation of a channel or a video on a channel that you think would be cool to look at. It's great to just get a different view of history a little bit. So I'll put some links up on the screen here for some other videos you can check out. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.